and gentlemen. My name is Mary Beth Mars, and I am the Assistant Dean for Undergraduate Programs and Strategic Initiatives here in the True Last College of Business. I'm pleased to welcome you to this distinguished alumni lecture today. Before we begin, I'd like to offer a couple of reminders. First, please assure that your cell phones are turned off, and also, we ask that you stay through the end of the program, which will conclude with a question and answer session. So once again, we are grateful to be able to welcome a successful executive to present this lecture as part of the College's speaker series. One of the strategic priorities for the True Last College of Business is collaboration. That is, joint activities bringing the business community together with our college. We strive for these collaborations to benefit the speaker and the college in a variety of ways. From the college's standpoint, collaborations like speaker series add knowledge about trends, issues, and practices in the business world, sometimes result in post-graduation employment opportunities for our students, and always bring valuable advice. I know the students and alumni speak very highly of these opportunities to hear from accomplished business executives. Now, from our partners' perspective, we hope they benefit from a greater likelihood of recruiting top talent and the personal gratification of sharing their expertise and experiences with today's students. I encourage you to ask questions following the lecture and feel free to come down and talk with our guest one-on-one -on -one as well. Now to today's speaker. Dave Hafner is President and CEO of Legan & Platt, a diversified manufacturer the company develops designs and produces a broad variety of engineered components and products that can be found in virtually every home, office, retail store, and automobile. Chances are that you slept on a Leggett product last night or sat in a car seat driving here that was made with Leggett components. When Dave joined Leggett and Platt in 1983 as Group Vice President of Operations, the company reported sales of approximately $275 million. Annual sales today now exceed $3 billion, and the 125-year-old firm is part of both the Fortune 500 and the S&P 500 index. Based in Carthage, Missouri, Leggett & Platt has more than 20,000 employees worldwide. Now, Dave and his colleagues have been very gracious hosts to students from the Cornell Leadership Program for several years. During these visits, students get an up-close and personal view of how a highly vertically integrated company operates. More importantly, they come away with a sense of the values of integrity, honesty, and customer service that Leggett's leadership team embody. It's easy to understand why Leggett and Platt has been included in Fortune Magazine's list of America's most admired companies. Dave is a proud alum of Mizzou and serves on the President's Advisory Council, is a member of MU's, or I'm sorry, Mizzou's Flagship Council, and is a member of our college's Davenport Society. He also serves his alma mater in a variety of other ways, including the Dean's Advisory Council in the School of Eng College of Engineering. Here in our college, we were pleased to honor him with the Special Citation of Merit Award in 1997. Please join me in giving a very warm Mizzou welcome to True Last College of Business friend, David Hafner. Thank you, Dave. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you. I'll move around a little bit, uh, but... Uh, well, that reminds me, I was up here Saturday for the game, and those of you that went to the game know how very hot it was, and as a result of that, I got a nice sun blister watching the Red Hawks, got a red nose, and I got to tell you, I got a little bit of a case of the red ass, <laughs> depending upon what happens to the Big 12. Um, but... Uh, Mary Beth's right, I'm, I'm sort of born and bred to be a Mizzou fan and alum. I'm very pleased to be here. I want to apologize to the, the people that uh, planned to listen to this presentation on the 20th of May. And my plan was to come up here late in the morning, fly up on one of our corporate planes, get a car and drive down here and interact and then have the lecture. And just about 30 minutes before the plane was supposed to take off, our chief pilot said, Dave, they've got Joplin Airport locked down. We aren't going to go anywhere. And the weather conditions were, at that particular point, the worst I could remember. Two days later, the Joplin tornado happened. 
which is just a few miles from our corporate office. We keep our planes in Joplin. And that was the worst I've ever seen. I apologize for not making it here that day. I'm here today, and uh, hopefully I won't put you all to sleep. Um, I was born and raised in Carthage. I come from a uh, economically, some of the MBA students heard part of this, an economically challenged family, which is okay. I mean, we all have socioeconomic differences in our backgrounds, but I always wanted to come to Mizzou. I always wanted to be an engineer. And long story made short, I was able to uh, finally get up here and get my undergraduate in engineering, <clears throat> and I'm so pleased that I did so because it was really a launching pad, if you will, for my career. Uh, so I love this university. I appreciate the opportunity to come back anytime you invite me, and I will continue to do so to the extent I can. Uh, just out of curiosity, since we're going to be talking about to some people what might be a relatively boring subject, how many people are on either a private or a public company board of directors? Okay. How many people aspire? Okay. As that uh, first slide says, I'm on Leggett and Platt's board of directors and have been for quite a few years. I'm also on the board of directors of another large public company called Bemis, headquartered in Wisconsin. They're one of the largest producers of um, packaging materials in the world. And then I also happen to be on two private boards. One of those, and the reason I, I want to talk about the difference between private and public boards here in a little bit, one of those is an international small biotech firm that I and two other engineer, two other, they happen to be engineers, but uh, two other Germans own. It's headquartered in Canada, and uh, my two partners live in Germany. Um, and then a personally wholly owned corporation, which I'm on the board of. And then I used to be on the board of a relatively large private civil engineering products company down in Atlanta, and I've got an interesting story to tell you about that later. I won't bore you with it right now. So, what we're here to talk about today is board composition and communication. Two related but very different topics. And some of the things that I would recommend that you consider, either while you're on the board or if you aspire and eventually get onto a board, things to do and things not to do. Now your mom said don't pick your nose in school, don't pick your nose in a boardroom, but there's, it's really more sophisticated than that. So what makes up the perfect board? I don't think there is such a thing, quite honestly, but the answer to that question is a function of the type of business as well as the size and complexity of the business or the enterprise. There are lots of boards that, that are not capitalistic boards. They may be service boards. They may be advisory boards. And so I suspect if, if uh, I asked the question, how many of you serve on that type of board, quite a few more hands would go up. A lot of the same criteria go into service on those boards as the capitalistic boards. Um, it's also dependent upon the, uh, whether it's a regional or global scope of the business. If all we did was make mule harnesses in Jasper County, our board might have a different composition than the fact that, that Leggett and Platt is a, <clears throat> a large international corporation. And the composition can vary based upon whether the company is public or private. So building an effective board in today's environment. What do I mean by today's environment? Well, it's a hell of a lot cooler than it was Saturday, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the, uh, the governance pressures that public companies, especially public companies, are under today and I can tell you, as this slide suggests, there it is definitely no slam dunk or layup in this age of Sarbanes-Oxley or Dodd-Frank and other of the challenges that we're all experiencing, the financial implosions, the, 
unemployment, etc. There are a lot of investors who are unhappy for, for various reasons. And it takes a lot more time to be a board member, to be an effective board member than it ever has in the past because of all of these various elements of pressure and question that come to bear. Now if that wasn't bad enough, the candidate pool has shrunk, although I think I see about 150 candidates that raised their hands here. The pool has shrunk and really truly extraordinary, capable board members are much harder to recruit than ever before because of all the uh, legal and liability exposure that comes with the responsibility of being on a board. So exposure as a board member, liability exposure has never been greater. The ability to assess risks and rewards is crucial and indeed the whole subject of corporate risk analysis, I don't know if you teach a class on it, but it's a whole topic in and by itself. And companies, public and private, do it differently. Some do it more sophisticatedly than others, but it is a very, very important part of today's board membership and the governance pressures that you feel. And then I put on this slide, trading up to replace inefficient existing members can prove challenging. It's like saying, well, you're no longer a part of the team. And that's a tough putt. Uh, but when, when you take a look at the board member competencies, some board members are much better than others, and generally there's this distribution, and some of the hard decisions that corporations have had to make in their manufacturing environments, and their service environments, they need to make in the boardroom. All right, so board capability should align with the company's strategy. Well, that, that sounds like godmother and apple pie. Um, so let's talk about composition. An effective board member must clearly understand the aspects of the company. It really needs, that member needs to understand its mission. It needs to understand its strategy, whether or not the strategy is really appropriate for the enterprise. It needs to understand the corporation or the enterprise's values, its strengths, and even more importantly, its weaknesses. And I put a note on there that says this takes time for a totally new board member to become effective in that regard because Unless it's a unifaceted company, uh, it becomes uh, very complex to understand all the products, to understand all the customers, to understand the various regions, the laws, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not whining, but it is a lot uh, easier to say than it is to do. So it takes time to become really effective in a complex corporation. Now, Relative to attributes and skill sets, not all board members will have, or in fact they should not have, the same skill sets. If they were all industrial engineers, which happen to be I'm one, they would probably be too aligned. And we're, we don't do very well sometimes at marketing or certain other things. So. You don't want the same skill sets, and I'll talk about gap analysis and how, how you might go about doing that uh, to strengthen a board later, but all of the board members must, must, they absolutely must, have the same level of integrity, their integrity quotient, if you will, honesty, and commitment to the shareholders. And so, some of the, the governance requirements say, well, we'll take care of that commitment to the shareholder. We'll require the board member to hold a certain amount of equity, and that's a good thing. The challenge, in my mind, is that that equity is given to the board member as a part of his stipend, and that's not a bad thing. So he or she has to keep a 
multiple of that for some period of time, but what I found is very effective is the board member that goes out, if he or she has the capability, if it's a public company, and buys a meaningful amount of the equity. You watch what happens when, when that's done. Senior internal management will sit up straight and say, oh, wow. And it, it will make the board member be immediately more aligned than taking the five years to get within their required ratio. Not everybody can do that, but it sure, it sure works. Um, now, public companies must have at least one financial expert, and most have more than one financial expert. Um, and the definition of financial expert you can look up. It uh, requires a certain amount of uh, competency. But uh, several skill sets within the ranks will provide substantial value. What you want is a team that uh, not only can throw the ball, but can tackle and whatever analogy you want to use. So you want a, the right mixture of capability within your board. High technology companies are likely to need more, need more technically oriented directors, and that makes sense. Consumer product companies, more marketing experienced directors. And I can tell you that being in the business of making consumer durables, we make components that then go into other items that Mary Beth mentioned that are consumer durables. So our customer is not the ultimate user, it's our customer's customer. So we can be, if we're, if we're not careful, we can be too insulated from a marketing or a selling perspective. We can be really good at converting materials into extraordinary uh, products, namely engineering and production and quality and all of those things, but you really need to understand how your product is marketed. So marketing and sales executives or people are becoming even more attractive than ever on boards. Medical and pharma, they're looking for more doctors and, and uh, research scientists and people that have regular experience with regulatory compliance. But many effective boards also have members with experience in a host of other things. And what I'm trying to do is make everybody feel good here. Everybody feel good here. Um, because quite honestly, uh, in certain venues, a particular uh, competency or skill set, regardless of what it happens to be, can be applicable. So um, a lot of times you'll have corporations, I've got a little fly that's after me up here, you'll have corporations that uh, will look for educational uh, people, staff from universities. As an example, on Bemis, the dean of the engineering college is one of our board members. And it's primarily because of the technical aspect of, of their business. But anyway, the, the upshot is that everybody can play in this game if you're qualified. It truly depends upon the nature of the company. So, skill set gap analysis. In a perfect world, which there isn't such a thing, the question would be, well, uh, what would we have as a collective set of competencies for this particular enterprise? It's not a perfect world. Um, and usually what happens is you have a slate of directors that exist that either have thin spots, that is you need more effectiveness in a particular discipline, or there are times where you've got an overabundance in another uh, particular skill set. Neither of those is optimal, for sure. And so gap analysis needs to be done now this whole thing gets more complicated when we throw in such things as the overall number of board members, which we'll talk about a little bit later, age limitations, which most corporations have, uh, or enterprises have, and then the dreaded, just downright poor performing director. And there are such animals. 
out there in corporate America. But the nominating committee needs to clearly understand the skill sets that the enterprise requires and be able to assess what currently exists and then be willing to go out and make sure that the next individual that they add to the slate or recommend to the nominating committee has those skill sets. And you hope the chair of the nominating committee is not one of the poor performing directors. It's like the, it's like the uh, idiot controlling the asylum, so to speak. Uh, incidentally, in both public companies that I'm in, that's not a problem. So since this is being videotaped, I need to make sure I say that. <laughs> you never know where that stuff shows up. Now, we've got great nominating uh, chairs on both of those companies. So uh, another thing that's been, been bothersome with, uh, to me and to some other people that uh, happen to be inside directors, I'm an inside director, non-independent director at Leggett. I'm an independent director at Bemis. But getting the mixture of inside and outside independent versus non-independent directors is really important. And those of you that believe that everything that the uh, corporate governance uh, gurus write, you're wrong. You're wrong. The reason I say that is that there are plenty of people in corp that profess to be corporate governance experts that say, well, all you need is one. You got, you need, you're going to have 12, you only need one inside. And usually that's going to be the CEO. I believe that is wrong. And the reason I believe that is wrong is that unless you just don't have competent CFOs, chief operating officers, and other C-suite executives, then there needs to be more of those in your mix. Now, I agree that it should not be a majority of insiders. And I even agree that, that a, uh, even if you want to call a supermajority of independent, makes some sense. But don't believe everything you read about corporate governance because eventually what will happen if you've got an outstanding CFO, let's take a CFO, and she aspires to be on that board, and not only aspires to be on the board, she's more qualified and capable than some of the other independent board members. If you don't give her that opportunity, she is likely to leave. That's a mistake for the enterprise, in my opinion. Um, so anyway, just be sensitive to that as you um, get into a position where you can opine and if someone calls bullshit on that, say, well, call Hafner. He'll talk to you about it. Because I live it every day. Um, there's no absolute right number of total board members. Uh, many times I think public companies err on the high side here. But remember, when I say err on the high side, that means they have too many. So if you get the right people, the right mixture of people and competencies, you can use a lot fewer people. And a board membership, I mean, it varies the cost of a board membership, but you can easily spend two hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars or more for that board member. And so it's a mean. You got to sell a lot of sinuous wire and chair components to cover that. So. Getting the right people and picking the right number makes a lot of sense. Diversity and internationality, this kind of goes without saying, but uh, obviously strive for ethnic and gender, uh, gender diversity and other types of, of, uh, of diversity. But don't let some target of ethnicity or gender drive you to pick someone that is not the best person. And the human resource people of the world will say, well, you just didn't interview enough people, because here's the ratio. Well, I guess if you had forever to do interviews and 
the world was your territory, you could probably uh, side with that. But basically, be mindful of trying to, di to diversify as you do some screening, but always hire the best person, the best candidate. And then global companies are very well advised to have a degree of international makeup in their boards. Down in southwest Missouri, we speak a certain version of English, I guess. Um, and quite honestly, we don't speak a lot of Hindi. We don't speak a lot of uh, Chinese, and there's several dialects in China. We don't speak Portuguese, generally speaking. And yet we have operations in all those types of countries. The cultures are different. The values are different. So to the extent that you're a global company, try to, uh, to broaden your ethnicity and, and internationality. Age limits. What constitutes being too old? Now, I used to think gray hair did. Not, not so much today. And I, I, at least from my perspective. Um, and indeed, age limits are moving up in many company guidelines. A lot of public companies say, well, there's a mandatory uh, retirement from the board at age 70, as an example. But many companies have moved that to 72, 73, 74. And uh, not just because I'm now, my age still has a five handle on it, but it soon is going to change. Uh, not just because of where I am age-wise, I am a strong believer in this last bullet point. Keen minds with the ability to adapt to quickly changing environments are ageless. And I would go on to say that they're priceless when you factor in experience, battle scars, and business savvy. So... I think it's important not to have a bunch of old codgers or codgerettes uh, on the board, but quite honestly, some of the most uh, effective board members that, that, that I interact with, and I interact with a whole bunch more than just on the boards that I'm on because of some other networking, are women and men well in their 70s. And I can think of a couple in their, in their 80s. Now, those are on private boards, but uh, uh, never uh, miss the opportunity to take advantage of experience. Uh, that said, most public companies will have a limit. And now there are ways to petition against or, uh, uh, in favor of a, of a change in that limit for short periods of time, and a lot of companies are doing that too. Recasting the poor actor. Now, you've probably had some experience in this since you were on that traveling show. Um, not that you were the poor actor, actress. Um, this can be a very challenging task. Let's say you have a slate of 10 directors, and, or any number of directors, but there is at least one of them that really isn't pulling his weight or her weight. Trying to get somebody uh, to take that particular position is really important for the enterprise. Uh, the chairman and the nominating committee chair need to be in agreement and then a direct and honest interaction with the to be traded director is the best approach and I know that's, that uh, sounds easy to do and not so, I mean easy to say and not so easy to do, but it's really important. If you've got an underperformer, it's like any team, if you sports team or manufacturing team, if you've got an underperformer, you really need to do something about it. So then another question is, do we use a search firm in, the, in finding that next board member? There are lots of good search firms. They will allow you to pay them a lot of money in order to assist you in your gap analysis. And what I've always found interesting, and we've used search firms at times, what I found interesting is the gap analysis is the direct result of sitting down and talking to the senior executives and the other chair, uh, the, the other board members, including the chair. So uh, I've gotten pretty good at doing gap analysis for Leggett and Platt for the last 15 years or so, and then I would give it to my boss, and then my boss would talk to the chair, and, and uh, 
because we know, generally speaking, the current board members and senior management know where the gaps are. And I'm not trying to, new, so if your Uncle Frank has a search firm, I'm not trying to submarine him. It's just that if you can do it yourself, you can save a lot of money, and generally you will get a better selection quicker. If you can't do it yourself, or if someone doesn't have the time to do it, then uh, obviously you can use one of these search firms. You may want to use a screening committee before exposing candidates to the full board. Uh, but if you do, that committee should include the CEO, again, not saying it because I happen to be one, it's just that that CEO, she or he will know more about the corporation than anybody else, much more than the, board the independent board members. And it also should include the chair of the nominated committee and the board of director chair if it's not the CEO. If it's an independent chair, you should, you should include the CEO, the independent chair, and the chair of the nominated committee. And then I would recommend that utilizing the decision-making uh, decision matrix with musts and wants can be very helpful if you've got candidates. Let's say you're looking, you've got it down to the last three and you're going through that screen. Um, determining what really are the musts and what the wants are for that particular board member is very helpful. I'd recommend using something like a Kepner Trigo or a Harvard decision matrix. Those are some of the tools that I'm referring to. And then I would expose finalists to the whole board in an environment conducive to business and social interchange. And I don't mean getting drunk and throwing darts, I, but, but, it, but you, you need to get out of the clinical environment enough so that you can get to know them as a person, you can get to know what their uh, outside interests are, what, what their uh, family situation is, and it just makes for a better holistic decision. There we go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed up here because I, I, I want to answer a question or two towards the end. Um, effective communication. One of the things that I look at whenever I go to a board meeting is I look at who's talking. And if someone's not talking, my antenna goes up. And if someone is talking, this is, this is Boolean logic. If someone is talking, either they're saying something important or they're not. Okay. So you've got to decide who's talking and what are they saying. And it's not just what you say, but how you say it and how often you say it. Board members that remain silent to other board members or management between formally scheduled meetings are not optimizing their value. Or, just between us, they may be showing their lack of commitment or their lack of capability. So being silent that strong, silent type may not be the way to go to be an effective board member. However, too much interjection or untimely interaction can cause frustration within management ranks. I like to call this the helicopter analogy. Four times a year, here come the helicopters, and they land and a buttload of dust goes up. And, you know, you're sort of blinded for a period of time, and then they leave. That's not an effective board. That can be very frustrating for management. So communicating in between those formal board sessions, whether it be four times a year or six or eight or whatever it happens to be, is really important. And finding that Goldilocks, that not too hot, not too cold, kind of just right approach is important. And be seen and understood as a team member and supporter of management and the other board members. Again, sounds... Uh, you know, godmother and apple pie like, but it's, it's true. And this is where I wanted to tell you the story about that private company down in Atlanta that I was on, they, they made civil engineering products and I was on their board. And the board was made up of a couple of other inside management and then all the rest of the board were the, the uh, capital uh, representatives, the, the, the bank, that were syndicated in the mezzanine capitalist and this one particular individual from New York, I have nothing against New York, don't, don't particularly care to go as often as I go, but he's from New York and, and he would come down to Atlanta the night before the board meeting and try to get all of the board, independent board members, didn't invite management, into a bitch, a bitch session. 
And I went to one because I didn't know what it was, and then I wouldn't go to anymore. And that particular individual had a certain amount of investment. His firm had a certain amount of investment. This was a mezzanine capitalist. And he really didn't care about management. What he cared about was their investment and some particular ratios that they had within their enterprise. And he was not very, uh, he wasn't brilliant. Because one day in a board meeting, he had already alienated management, and he was starting to even upset some of the other mezzanine capitalists. Do you know how hard that is to do? I mean, they're like, they're, they're like bulletproof. And he said, if I could sell this stock for so much per share, I would sell, I would sell it. I said, sold. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'll buy it. He said, what do you mean, you personally? I said, yeah. Why, are you going to discriminate against me? So he'd put his foot in his mouth. I knew that, the, or I, at least I reckoned, that the value of those shares, because I was looking at a relatively long-term investment, I knew my way around the manufacturing plants, I knew the customers, I knew, I, I knew the value of the business. And so I goaded him into selling it to me. Now it turns out that the private company had restrictions so that those shares could only be purchased first by a certain number of the other private shareholders, the other shareholders. And the upshot is that inside management trumped him, gave me the opportunity to buy it, I bought, wrote him a check, and uh, little did I know that I, uh, unfortunately, I took away his chance to pay a whopping capital gain tax. I paid it. Actually, I haven't paid it. I haven't paid all of it. Because at that particular point, I didn't realize that eventually it would be sold to another private equity company, and they really loved this company. And so I took a certain amount of uh, preferred stock and a certain amount of cash, but some of you in the MBA program will know what I'm talking about when I talk about quirps, qualified replacement properties, and so I was able to buy equity in guess what company? Leggett and Platt. So a lot of what I have, I bought, I just wrote checks for, but I haven't paid tax on it because I haven't sold the leg and plate stock yet. So, um, uh, and I believe in paying taxes. I just believe in, in <coughs> stiff arming it as long as, as practical. <laughs> he made a terrible, terrible mistake. He was seen by management as, well, I won't mention what management had to say about him, but he was seen as a non-supporter he put his foot in his mouth. Even the other capitalists saw him as being dysfunctional, and then management had the opportunity to trump him and force the sale to me. Uh, I wish we still had that stock, but it eventually sold. Um, it's important if you've got a, uh, a chairperson that is not an internal executive, that you use that chairperson, that non-executive chairperson, or the lead director, if you happen to be an inside CEO chair, to assist in communication with the other independent board members. The CEO can communicate on a daily, if not hourly, or on minute by minute with the other inside directors, but it's really important to make sure that you're communicating with your independent directors. And in this age of electronic data transmission and communication, uh, there's really no excuse for not communicating. And it can be done instantaneously as long as the files, which will be encrypted because of the confidential nature of the data, uh, can uh, uh, withstand the firewalls and the distribution logistics that you have. And, and many companies are using virtual boardrooms, both the public companies that that I'm on, use them, and um, effectively you can eliminate a, lo a lot of paper, or all the paper, in, you, you know, with an iPad, 
you can have everything you want and you can get it that quick, okay? So you'll see more and more technology being used in the boardroom. Um, and it's an excellent way to communicate. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what works for one may work for another. If board members serve multiple companies, and many of the board members that are on these companies that I serve with also serve other companies, <clears throat> uh, their experience at one company can be shared with another board if practical and if it's not confidential. It's really important if you're a board member or you aspire to be a board member to understand where the Chinese walls, as we say, or the barriers of confidentiality exist. Don't ever breach them. If you have a question, double check it before you, remember, once you click send, it's sent. So just be mindful of where the, what the levels of confidentiality are. Experiences on public company boards may still be useful to private boards and generally are, I would say. The other way can be, but not so much. And, and am I discriminating against private boards? No. I mean, I'm on private boards. It's just that the private board member doesn't, is not required to become competent in these other public uh, restrictions and requirements. So if you aspire to go from a private board to a public board, it would be really good for you to do some research on what the public companies have to deal with that you as a private company don't have to deal with. It's, they're just different is all. And then beware of spandex syndrome. This is the one size does not fit all. As an example, what looks great on our golden girls doesn't look so good on the front defensive line. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, it just, it, it doesn't always work. So don't force your company or one company's policies and practices and protocol on another company unless it works. It can, but they have to be similar companies. They have to have sort of a similar physique and, and capabilities and competencies and what have you. Um, this phrase drives me up a wall. Well, at my firm, we do it this way. Generally, it drives me up a wall. Sometimes what's being done in other companies really, really makes sense for ours. But I, I, I'm not on your other company's board of directors. We're on this one. So try to be sensitive, or I try to be sensitive, making sure that I don't uh, try to impugn another company with Leggett and Platt's policies or procedures. The best communicators are first the best listeners. And I know that's, a, maybe it's said differently, but that's kind of an old adage. But there is very much to be learned by listening carefully and, and uh, to your fellow board members and to management. And to management and to management. Um, it's disheartening to listen to someone ramble, in fact, rant about their competencies or their capabilities in another company, in another part of the world or what have you. Um, so it, it, it's critical to listen and it's really important not to say too much. Disagreement can be healthy if everyone is willing to consider the reasoning behind someone else's opinion. I'm convinced of that. My wife is not convinced of that. So therefore she's usually right. And indeed Connie is usually right. But it's difficult to get people to be objective in disagreement. It'll be interesting to see how the political uh, dichotomy further polarizes tonight. I can't wait for the Saints and Packers game. 
I'm hoping Chase gets to play tonight. He's had a great preseason. Uh, but I lived in Green Bay for 10 winters is how I remember it. And so, you know. But anyway, if you've got an opinion, you should state it, even if it may not be congruent with others. And generally, it will not be congruent with everybody. That's okay. And in fact, that's your duty to do that. That's your duty to state your opinion. Remember, you and all the other board members are there to serve the shareholders, not yourselves. Even if you are shareholders, generally speaking, at least in public companies, you're going to be a very small percentage of the total share base. Your fiduciary responsibility is to the shareholder base in its entirety. And silence, as I've mentioned before, can be misdiagnosed as complacency or even worse, ignorance. So don't be the toad on the log. Mix it up with management. I really subscribe to pre-board meeting socials or dinners with management. And what that does is it provides you that wonderful opportunity to get to know Claudia and know that she's more than just an audiovisual specialist. She's got other things that really make her click. Um, you can find out some very interesting things about your management when you get into that social environment. Find practical ways to visit non-corporate company facilities. It always amazes me how many directors have never been into a facility of the companies that they serve. That just kind of blows my mind. Now, I was chief operating officer for a lot of years, and I'd really rather be in a factory than I would be in a boardroom. But there's so much to learn by going into a factory. Now, one nice thing about being with Leggett, we're, we're like everywhere. You know, you got 200 facilities worldwide, and Bemis has got a lot of facilities worldwide, and so what I can do is I can go to a particular part of the world or part of the country, and while I'm making that trip, I can go visit one of the other uh, board's plants, and I can get to know the people, and then I can, can uh, come back and, and talk to management about what I find out. And... Uh, that's a way, as I say here, to appreciate the value of the, and the quality of the cooking by going to the kitchen, going to those facilities. Share what you learn on your site visits with other directors. Not every director has the ability to do what I and some other people do because they don't have those other facilities. Share it with them. Recognize and compliment facility workers for their efforts and achievements. The power of a compliment, and teach us the, uh, this in engineering. The power of a compliment is huge, just huge. The human resource people know that. And just by getting exposure to those factory workers and plant management and complimenting them for a job well done or an effort exerted, before you can get back to your office, that will be known by upper management of the enterprise that you sit on the board. That's how quick it travels. So, I mean, don't throw out um, compliments for compliment's sake. Find good, objective ways to compliment people. And what happens is that you are going to be known as the type of board members that the shareholders need and management wants and employees appreciate. Um, it's just so powerful, powerful stuff. Yep. Question. All right, how are we on time, Mary Beth? We're doing, doing well. Are we, do we have any time? We do. We have about 15 minutes for some questions. So if you would, um, we'll have an opportunity to ask Mr. Hafford some questions. So who would like to begin? Yes, ma'am. Oh, there we go. Microphone. I'll be Jasper. I'm a sophomore in the Cornell Leadership Program. And this is kind of referring back to how you said your board wasn't that strong in marketing. Have you considered doing a rebranding campaign for Leggett and Platt, and not really just on a producer standpoint, but in a recruiting standpoint? I have to go back in time a little bit because that weakness in marketing, we did something about. We've got a couple of people 
on the board that are uh, really very capable. They, they haven't been on the board very long, but they're very capable relative to marketing. Uh, one of the senior executives of Energizer, they make batteries. And of course, that's a very marketing-oriented uh, product and company. Another one of our lady board members used to be the chief financial officer of Brown Foreman. Uh, that's an alcoholic beverage uh, producer. That's a lot of marketing. J Jack Daniels has a brand for a reason. That's because of Brown Foreman. And then Ace Hardware, as an example, these are the three most recent people that we put on the board. Um, uh, three of the four most recent people we put on the board. Uh, Ace Hardware Chief Executive Officer is also on our board. And the, that was part of the gap analysis that I did and the weakness that was identified and was one of the screens that we used. I still think going forward we'll probably have more marketing and salespeople on our board as we trade out some people. Good question. Hello, my name is Ryan Strumpf and I'm a freshman in the Cornell Leadership Program. My question is, how has the recession caused or affected the way you run your company and are you optimistic for an economic improvement? Yeah, it's a good question and it's a question that <clears throat> we get often um, when we take investor relations trips and I think most, uh, at least, well, manufacturing and service companies are probably getting this question. We were very significantly affected, more so uh, than some companies because remember the types of products that we produce. We produce things that go into a mattress. We produce things that go into an office chair or to an, uh, an adjustable lumbar for an automobile. All of those, most of the products that we make are durable goods and they are long-lived durable goods and generally they have, those are, those are the products that you can put off for a while. Hey, the bed's lumpy. Yeah, well, you know, we'll get one next month instead of this month. Uh, interestingly enough, automotive is, is going gangbusters right now. Uh, and uh, not just here in the United States, but also in Europe. It's tapered off a little bit for us in Asia. But we, were, we have been significantly affected, and I'll give you a metric. If you take a look at our capacity utilization, which we calculate by plant, by business unit, we like to run, based, based upon the way we measure it, at about 85% capacity utilization. Okay? Gives you a little breathing room for the unexpected breakdown, and it also provides you the opportunity to clean a system or changeovers or what have you. <clears throat> we are running on, on average closer to 60%. So just in round numbers, we've got, uh, we've got a 40% opportunity before we would ever have to add additional capital to build additional plants or new lines. Now, it isn't quite that easy because we've got a couple of our units that are running near 100%. But on average, it took us from the early 80s down to the 60s. That's brutal. And as a result of that, the follow-on answer is that well-managed companies then, when, you, when you're suffering, and you can consolidate to a certain extent, but when you, when you supply everybody in a particular industry, you can't take, you've got to be careful not to take too much capacity offline. Because when things do tick up, then if you're the, the primary supplier, if not the sole supplier, then you put your customer in a world of hurt. So what we did, like many companies, is we looked at reducing our corporate overhead, the cost nut, if you will, and found about $130 million worth of cost reduction to take out of the company. By doing so, those are, those are tough, brutally tough emotional things to do. It's like saying, okay, half of you, you're, you're gone out of the auditorium. You're no longer a part of this session. That's very hard to do, especially when your relatives involved and what have you. But the best managed companies did that. And as a result of that, the incremental volume when it does come back is just mathematics, just algebra. 
your margins, your incremental margins are significant. So the last part of your question was something to the extent, you know, how encouraged am I that things are going to get better? It's kind of like a friend of mine, I'd say, what's the weather going to be? And he'd say, dark, followed by light. And he was right. I think it's going to get better. Can't tell you when. Will it get worse before it gets better? It's coin toss, in my opinion. Uh, I, I, it, a lot of it will depend upon what happens between here and Thanksgiving, at least here in the United States. We were very severely affected. Amazing that we were able to improve profitability and margins when that happened. Uh, Mr. Hafner, my name is Bobby Hoffman. I'm a freshman CLP member. And you just talked about how your customer is not the ultimate consumer. And so I'm wondering when you guys are deciding what to manufacture, are you more concerned with the ultimate consumer or the person that you're selling to? I'll tell you, that is a, that's an excellent question. And especially for companies that are further back in the supply chain, excuse me, like like it is. And I can tell you that for decades, we relied primarily, if not solely, on what our customer felt they wanted, felt they needed, and we didn't go beyond that to the ultimate consumer. We didn't go ask your mom or your dad or you what you really wanted. And we still rely on our customers to give us input, but you know what we're finding? It's kind of like Henry Ford, I'll, I'll, I'll get this a little bit wrong, but Henry Ford said, if I had provided only what my customer expected, I would have generated a faster horse, not a car. And so we're doing more focus groups, some in conjunction with our customers, some independent of our customers, and we're trying to make sure that our research and development dollars, and all research and development reports up to me directly, um, that we get a better hit rate on the money that we spend on developing products, and that they're products that are likely to be highly uh, accepted by the consumer. I'll give you a quick example. I took my phones off because I didn't want them to ring here, put them in my briefcase, but everybody's got at least one, and a lot of us have two phones, and we've got an iPad, and we've got a laptop, and every one of those things has what we call a wall, a wall wart. That's a little transformer. And your, yeah, your iPad and your iPhone might use the same one, but your BlackBerry uses a different one and what have you. So uh, Leggett has developed a, a product in conjunction with another company where let's assume that's a BlackBerry and we just set it down and it charges. Whether it's on that table or in your car, of course there's a component in here. If we had gone and asked our customer, what do you think we should be working on? That never would have hit the radar screen. So we did some focus group analysis and talked to some other technology companies. The upshot is that uh, Leggett is just one of many companies that will do a better job of finding out what the ultimate consumer wants and needs and building those products as opposed to relying on what the intermediate customer. I'm not saying that they're bad. It's just that many times they don't really have the, the ultimate answer. Oh. Kind of two quick things, but have you ever been on a board that lost, that lost a proxy fight to where shareholders put someone on that you guys had not recommended? And if so, how do you massage that relationship if they have a certain agenda? And also, is that more of a concern as proxy access is theoretically going yeah, to get yeah, easier? Yeah, the, the, they're good questions. The answer to the first question is quick and easy, and the answer is no, I haven't. Obviously, I'm aware of that circumstance happening more frequently since 2007 than before, and um, hope I never go through that experience, but one of the things that, that uh, Leggett does, and I think all companies, even if they, 
especially if they had lost a proxy uh, argument or fight. They need to clearly understand who their shareholders are and they need to talk to them. They really need to talk to them and not in sort of an adversarial way because the numbers are what they are. And understand what the, the issues are. Sometimes the shareholder doesn't understand what's going on. That's quite often the case. And then sometimes management can be arrogant enough to assume that the, the independent shareholder doesn't know what's going on. So communication becomes really important. Again, easier to say than do, but we do a lot of communication with our major shareholders, uh, institutional shareholders I'm talking about. Okay, I think we, one more question, then we need to wrap it up. So um, in the back up there. And I'll hang around for a few minutes to try to answer some of the others. Uh, recently, a lot of manufacturing companies in America have uh, increased profits by jumping into emerging markets like China and Southeast Asia, but at the cost of labor. Uh, has Leggett and Platt dealt with that at all? Yes, absolutely, we have. <clears throat> We've got, I'll just use China as the example. We've got 10 operations in China. A couple of those operations really resulted as uh, were, were due to us exporting jobs from Mississippi and Kentucky to China. Now, I was born and bred in Jasper County, Missouri, but remember, I'm a, it's a global corporation that I'm having to say grace over, or get to say grace over. What happened in that particular case, our customers demanded, our, our customers were, they were furniture manufacturers that had a lot of labor in producing this beautiful leather uh, upholstered reclining chair or sofa. A lot of labor in producing that. And so they took their assembly to Asia where they could get a much, much lower uh, fully burdened labor cost but they demanded Leggett and Platt product because of the quality, okay? And the laws of physics are the same around the world and you can make quality products anywhere you want, but at that particular point in time, they were shipping container after container over to Asia, put it into the product, and then put it into another container and ship it back to the United States or Canada or Europe. And that's a very expensive proposition for our customers. So we effectively were uh, encouraged, that's a nice way of saying levered, to go to China to produce a product that is indistinguishable from what we produce here, but it effectively cut their freight cost or logistics cost significantly. The other plants that we have in China are pr producing products that um, are used in that indigenous Chinese or Asian market and so then some of them make products that are partially used there and partially shipped uh, around the world. It's a, that's a tough thing to go to one of your plants and say, oh, guess what, we're shutting this plant down. We have 300 people. That, that, no, that's not even right. You've got 300 families that are gonna be affected. And that's, uh, that's what, that'll give you gray hair when you have to do that too often. But, being a global company, uh, it's just a matter of time. We're looking at maybe moving some Chinese operations to other parts of the world. Go figure. So. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dave. That was very informative. We appreciate you taking your day, spend your day with us. Uh, before everyone departs, I want to thank those who provide valuable assistance for today's um, Distinguished Alumni Lecture. In particular, thank you very much to Claudia and the great folks at Academic Support, Recess Inc. and our advancement staff. And Dave, would you please come up here so I can thank you as well? We have for you, it says Robert J. Trula, Senior College of Business, University of Missouri, in appreciation to Dave Hafner, Distinguished Alumni Lecture, September 8th, 2011. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And as, and as luck would have it, we have a gift for
for you that will help assist with you at one of those red spots you referred to earlier. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, you. that'll take care of the other red that I was experiencing. Thank you, Mary Beth, Thank so much. Thank you very much. And again, feel free to come down, and Mr. Hafner has graciously agreed to stay a little bit later and um, answer any questions you might have. So thank you all very much for attending, and have a wonderful day.